Hello brothers and sisters in Christ and uh, welcome back. We're going to do the last uh, part in the Likeness of Sinful Flesh series. And we talked about what likeness of sinful flesh is in part one. Part two we talked about how Satan tried to tear Jesus down and tempt that flesh that he was in to get him to be actually like uh, not likeness of sinful flesh but sinful flesh. To be corrupted, to be a sinner just like the rest of us. He's not. He threw Satan off, said, hey, he wasn't deceived, he wasn't tempted. I mean, he was tempted by Satan, but he, he didn't give in to temptation. Uh, part three was we talked about how man did it. Man tried to tempt Jesus and get him to sin so he would no longer be in the likeness of sinful flesh, but that he would be a sinner. And now we're going to be talking about Bible perversions. A few things in the Bible perversions that I grabbed real quick and talk about how they're trying to tear Jesus down and make it where he's a sinner. He's not in the likeness of sinful flesh. He was just like everybody else. It's tearing Jesus down to our level. We're sinners. We're in a corruptible body that has been corrupted. So they're trying to make Jesus out to be a sinner like us. So uh, Romans 8, 1. Always try to read this at the beginning of each one so we can understand the context of likeness of sinful flesh. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. 3. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Okay. That's where we get that. And for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Likeness of sinful flesh. When Jesus was born, he was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. And how do we know that it's the likeness? If you go to the Old Testament, to the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14, I believe this pretty much explains the likeness of sinful flesh. Okay? He came in the likeness, meaning that he had a corruptible body, Okay, and part of that likeness someone explained to me was that, and I, I've already said this before, that the, when sin entered the world, death entered the world, time entered the world, okay, people started growing old, people started dying, there was pain, you could feel pain, okay. The, part of the likeness of sinful flesh is the punishment of sin in the sense that time came into the world. Jesus was born, he grew old. I mean, he grew up to be 33 before he died on the cross. But you understand what I'm saying? He was in a world where he grew with the world as far as his body grew older. He wasn't a baby for 33 years. Right? And he got hungry, he got tired, he could feel pain. But the sinful flesh, it's the cost of sin. Okay, we're in a corruptible body. Right? So Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, read that again real quick. Therefore the Lord... Sh himself shall give you a, a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Future prophecy about Jesus Christ being born. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. That right there, for before, let's read the next one real quick. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. It's a future prophecy. Jesus is going to come in the likeness of sinful flesh, and he's going to know to choose the good over the evil. And all this time we talked about it, uh, Satan tempts him to choose the evil. He's in a body that can be tempted. He's being tempted to choose the evil, but he always chose the good. Mankind tried to tempt him to choose the evil. He always chose the good. But what about the future, how they like to rewrite the past, all these Bible perversions that go against I'm a King James Bible believer. The King James Bible is God's perfect written word in English. So what about these Bible perversions? What do they do now that that's the 33 years that Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh we're going to talk about this. We've already have. He's been in the flesh in the Old Testament. He had an incorruptible body of flesh in the Old Testament. He still has his incorruptible body today and on into the future. But he came for 33 years in the likeness of sinful flesh. That's the body of flesh he came in was likeness of sinful flesh. Okay. Uh, so the first one we're going to talk about is um, John 7, 7. 
So if you want to turn to John 7, 7. This is like a big one. This is like the most obvious one in all these Bible perversions, most of them, if not all of them. Um, they try to make Jesus out to be a sinner. And if he's a sinner, he can't be God. And he's not the likeness of sinful flesh. He is sinful flesh. And that's the whole big push of these uh, modern Bible versions, is to tear Jesus down to be on the same level as we are. And I don't want to jump ahead, but also, um, I'll probably talk about this again, but in the Garden of Eden, you can be as God's knowing good and evil. So bottom line, it's about... We're down here. God is so far up here you can't even see my hand. We're down here. Okay? And what's it about? Well, we can lift ourselves up because we can become God's knowing good and evil. And let's tear Jesus down. So now we're on the same level. And that's what's going on. Okay? John 7, 7. We try to make Jesus out to be a liar. And we're going to read to 10. The world cannot hate you, but me it hated, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Jesus' works are good. He always chose the good over the evil. The world's works are evil. Go ye up unto this feast. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet fully come. Okay. There's a feast going on. His brothers, I could have gone back and talked more, but his brothers don't believe that Jesus is who he is. And yes, Mary had sons and daughters after Jesus. Okay, she's not a perpetual virgin. Uh, it's, a, it's paganism and Satanism, the Catholic Church, the Mary that Catholic Church worships. And they worship her, but that's one other thing. But he's saying, I'm not going to go up to this feast. Okay. Verse 9, when he had said these words in unto them he abode still in Galilee. So he hadn't gone up to the feast. He says, I go up not yet to the feast. Verse 10, But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. So the word yet is the big word, okay? One word means a lot. You can take out one word and it will destroy the context. Okay? If you took out the word yet, which the Bible perversions do, you make Jesus out to be a liar. In the King James Bible, he said, I go up not yet. Okay. Now, Titus 1.1. 1, 1. Turn to Titus 1.1 1, 1 real quick. I go up not yet, so it showed that he didn't go up when they went up. That's the yet part. He didn't go up when they went up. His brothers and all, his family went up. He went up later. So is that a lie? No, Jesus didn't lie. Titus 1.1. 1, 1. Titus is a small book. <laughs> I'm going to read 1 and 2. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness. Truth is after godliness. And I say that because that's what we're trying to talk about, truth here. And we're going to find out these Bible versions like to pervert the truth and turn it into a lie. Verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. So the Jesus of the King James Bible, with the verse we just read, he didn't lie. He's God. There's so many other things, but we're just talking about that one context right now. He's God. He didn't lie. That, that did not tarnish his, us being able to say that Jesus is God, because it's not a lie. He said, yet, I go up, not yet to the feast. Now let's look at the NIV. I'm going to be reading off some of the Bible perversions and showing how they go against each other, like contradict themselves, and they're trying to tear Jesus down, make him out to be a liar. So John 7:7 7, 7 in the NIV, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that it's its works are evil. You go to the festival, I am not going up to this festival. Because my time has not yet fully come. Where's the yet? It's not there. They're saying, Jesus is saying, I'm not going to this festival. He just told them, I'm not going. After he had said this, he stayed in Galilee. Okay, so far so good, right? 
Verse 10, however, after his brothers had left for the festival, he went also, not in public, but in secret. What did they just do? They made Jesus out to be a liar. Jesus said, I'm not going, period. Okay. He says, I'm not going up to this festival because my time has not, not fully come, period. There's a period there. I'm not going up. Then they show him going up. He just lied. According to the NIV, Jesus is a liar. Their own book, Titus 1.1 1, 1 in the NIV. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness and hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. Their own book says that God is not a liar. God cannot lie. So what is their Bible perversion, the Catholic Bibles? All these Bible perversions, do the Bible studies. I've got videos on my channel, if you're watching this and you're new, of the Bible version issue. Uh, Brother Brian at King James Video Ministries on YouTube has videos on them. I don't know if Brother JT does at uh, Sinners to Repentance. Um, and some of the other brothers in Christ. But I know Brother Brian did a has a lot on the Bible version issue. Okay, They're Catholic Bibles. They're not Christian Bibles. Okay? But we see here that through their own Bible, they've tore Jesus down and made Jesus out to be a liar. Then they turn around and tell you that God cannot lie. If Jesus is God, he's way up here. Oh, but now Jesus is a liar, which means what? According to their Bible, he's not God. See, Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh, but these other Bibles like to tear him down and say, hey, he is sinful flesh, just like you and me. He's just a man like you and me. Okay? No better than you, no less than you. We can be as gods, knowing good and evil. We get to come up, and we tear, they tear Jesus down, so now we're supposed to be on equal level. Sometimes they like to think they're above Jesus. They all believe they're above Jesus because this whole concept of what they do makes them feel like they're their own God and they're above Jesus Christ. But you understand what I'm saying? They're trying to bring Jesus down, pull themselves up, tear Jesus down, so now they're on equal level. And they're not. Okay, Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He was tempted. We've talked about this by man in the Bible, by Satan in the Bible. He'd quote part, Satan would quote partial scriptures, and then he would um, add his own words to it, like what we're reading here with these Bible versions, okay? And Jesus stuck to the scriptures. He didn't add to or subtract, okay? Man came and tried to trip him up. He wouldn't lie to him, all right? Uh, that's the NIV. The NASV, John 7, 7. The world cannot hate you, but it hated me because I testified of it that its deeds are evil. Go up to the feast yourselves. I do not go up to this feast because my time is yet not, not yet fully come. There's a period. Having said these things to them, he stayed in Galilee. But when his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he himself also went up, not publicly, but as it is in secret. So they show here in the NASV, and I'm just showing a few of them. I do not go up to this feast. Where's the word yet? They, they don't even say at this time. They say, I don't go up to this feast. He's not going. He told them, I'm not going. And then he goes. What does that do? That makes Jesus out to be a liar. In the NASV, New American Standard Bible, Titus 1.1, because I've always got to throw this in there, Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth which is according to godliness and the hopes of eternal life which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. So their own Bible says, their perversion says, God can't lie, Jesus is a liar. Therefore, if Jesus is a liar, he can't be God. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. No, no, no. He, he is sinful flesh. You know, he's just like anybody else, you and me. You see what I'm saying? Bible perversions have been tearing Jesus down. And I didn't know this as a Bible. I used to be a false convert for most of my life. I started out with the New King James, which is a perversion. It takes reading from the King James and reading from all these Bible versions, other Bible versions, and tries to mix them. And it's a transition book to get you away from the King James Bible and over to an NIV. 
or an NASV because that's what happened to me. They gave me a new King James. I didn't even know there was a King James, but there had to have been. I mean, when you think about it, new means there had to be something that was old. So, um, but that pushed me over to, they, they got me into a NIV in a heartbeat. Okay. These Bibles are tearing Jesus down. They're Antichrist Bibles. They're preaching a Jesus that's not the Jesus of the King James Bible. Their Jesus is a sinner. Their Jesus is a third of God. We'll be talking about that too. Their Jesus is just a third of God. Okay. Their Jesus is a created being. There's people who fight after doing the study. There's still people who fight that Jesus is a created. His body is physically created. He didn't have a body in the Old Testament. And we've proven, and we're going to talk about some of it here too, that he had a body in the Old Testament. He had flesh in the Old Testament. He had flesh when he came and was born of a Virgin Mary. He had flesh at the resurrection, and he has flesh all out into eternity. Okay? The difference is, was what type of flesh? Okay? 33 years that he was on the earth, it was likeness of sinful flesh. Old Testament, it was an incorruptible body of flesh. New Testament, present tense, on out in the future. A body, incorruptible body, a glorified body of flesh. Mm -hmm. So the NIV made Jesus out to be a liar and claimed that Jesus isn't God. There's no way you can get around it. God's not a liar, but Jesus is, therefore Jesus isn't God. Same thing with the NASB. New Living Translation. John 7, 6, Jesus replied, Now it's not the right time for me to go, but you can do any but you can go any time the world can't hate you but it doesn't hate me because i accused it of doing evil now stop right there i was like okay wait a minute maybe it's not going to pervert the word cuz it says now is not the right time for me to go okay. verse 8 you go on i am not going to this festival cuz my time has not yet come there he goes they got him saying i'm not going again at first, it almost was like he's not going to go at this time, but they flat out say that Jesus said he's not going to that festival. After saying these things, Jesus remained in Galilee, but after his brother, brothers left for the festival, Jesus also went, though secretly, staying out of public view. So they have Jesus saying, I'm not going, and then they have Jesus physically going. What is that? It's called lying. He lied. I'm not saying Jesus did. I'm saying they say he did in this uh, New Living Translation version. Okay. Titus 1.1 1, 1 in the New Living Translation. This letter is from Paul, a slave of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. I have been sent to proclaim faith to those God has chosen and to teach them to know the truth that shows them how to live godly lives. This truth gives them confidence that they have eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised them before the world began. Brothers and sisters of Christ, when we get saved, born again, we, and I try to teach people the way I was taught, you compare Scripture with Scripture, and that's exactly what I'm doing in their own Bible perversions. They have a verse that says, God cannot lie. So if someone comes to you and says, I'm God, and they lie to you, that's proof that they're not God. God cannot lie. I've lied. I know anybody that's watching this has lied before. Okay? And not one person can claim they didn't lie except for one person. That's Jesus Christ. So, their own Bibles, comparing Scripture to Scripture with their own Bibles, not only are they making Jesus out to be a liar, a sinner, but they're saying he's not God. They're tearing Jesus down. Okay? Remember the Old Testament, I'll say this again. Uh, Adam and Eve, the serpent gets to Eve and uh, beguiles Eve and uh, deceives Eve and says that you can be as God's known good and evil. Trying to get man to say, well, maybe I can bring myself up. And man can never bring himself all the way up. And they can't, they can't even bring himself up a little bit. But the understanding is, is man cannot be God. We know this, brothers and sisters of Christ. Uh, but they're trying to pull themselves up. And what do they do? They got well, we got to tear Jesus back down. So that's the only way we can, in our own delusion, and our own dece uh, being deceived, and the flesh trying to rule us, try to get Jesus to be equal with us. And that's what we're seeing here. Okay? Bible perversion. Jesus is not a liar. Jesus is God. Capital G, God, fully and completely. 
So there's an instance we see in the Bible perversions, and I only grab a few of the Bible perversions, but you can look through them online. A lot of the Bible perversions take out the word yet, if not all of them. They make Jesus out to be a liar. And then you cross-reference it with the other verse I just did there, Titus 1.1 1, 1 and 1.2, 1, and you'll see that they're saying Jesus isn't God. Right. Now, another one that they make Jesus out to be a sinner is Matthew 5.21. We're going to read the truth, and then we're going to talk about how they make Jesus into a sinner. Matthew 5, 21. We're going to read through 22. Okay. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. What we read up there is, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall be killed shall be in danger of judgment. What's the judgment? The punishment for murder was that you'd be killed. And you deserve to die for sinning. That's that sin, that murder. Okay. Now, the key words here are without a cause. Okay? Jesus is saying anybody who's angry without a cause. And the Bible perversions, as we're going to get into this, take that without a cause. So basically, if you get angry at a brother, you're a sinner. You're worthy of death. Okay? Now we turn to Matthew 21.12. And Jesus went up into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. In the book of John, it talks about how he makes a cord and he really chases them out of there. He gets angry at them. They're trying to make it a business, kind of like today. You know, these Babel buildings are not in Scripture, and these Babel buildings, they call them, I, they're supposed to be a Bible building. I say Babel building because they babble. They're not based on the Word of God. And they're temples, but it's all—it's a business because they got to keep those doors open and they've got to keep the lights on, so they've become a business. Jesus got angry. I mean, you read this, you read the event in John where it talks about the same event. Jesus got angry, and he had a cause. What was that cause? Give me a second. Uh, cast them out that sold and bought in the temple. And said unto them, it is written, verse 13, And said unto them, it is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer. But ye have made it the den of thieves. That was his cause. They turned the house of God, that's supposed to be a house of prayer, into a house of thieves. He had a cause. So according to the King James Bible, Jesus didn't sin. Okay? He's, not, he's not a sinner, and he didn't deserve to die. I'm kind of pushing towards the cross because we're going to get into these Bible versions because what they're actually saying is, is Jesus is a sinner and he deserved to die on the cross. He wasn't innocent. Okay? He didn't become sin who knew no sin. He knew sin. You know what I'm saying? Uh, the NIV, Matthew 5.21 in the NIV. You have heard that it was said... To the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murdered will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. They took out the words without a cause. Anybody that's angry. Again, anyone who says to the brother or sister Raka is answerable to the court, and anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Now, one thing we got to cross-reference, I know the Bible perversion people, they hate this. We compare Scripture with Scripture, okay? And we're dispensational. It's a whole other study. You can look on my channel. I have some studies for dispensational teaching. 
Um, there's different dispensations. The whole Bible is written for us. In other words, I can go through the whole Bible and get instruction of righteousness and learn about history, learn about the line of David, you know, people. I can read through the whole Bible. It's all written for us. But when it comes to commands, what's written to us, the whole Bible is not written, written to us. The Old Testament says you have to do animal sacrifices. That's not written to me. It's written for me. I can go back there and read about the animal sacrifices, why they had to do them. They're important because they lead to the New Testament, Jesus' the death on the cross. But we are not commanded to do animal sacrifices anymore. Okay, so all the Bible's written for us, but all the Bible isn't written to us. We compare Scripture with Scripture, and these Bible perversions don't like it. So in their Bible, they say that if you get angry at a brother or sister, you're guilty. Okay, you sinned. Now, in their own Bible, Matthew chapter 21, 12 in the NIV, Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables. That's how bad it was. It wasn't just say, hey, get them out of here. Let's get slowly get these tables out and everything. He went in there and he flipped the tables over according to their own Bibles. Okay. The money changers and the bench of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. See, even in their own version, he had a cause, but they took that out, so it doesn't matter if you have a cause or not. If you get angry, you've sinned, and you're worthy of judgment. Let that sink in. In other words, when Jesus died on the cross, he deserved it. Uh, no, he didn't. He took on the sins of the world, my sins. Okay, I deserve to be on that cross, not Jesus Christ. It's so important. Likeness of sinful flesh versus actual flesh that sinned. There's a difference, brothers and sisters in Christ. It's the whole point of this study. The NASB, Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. Ye, you have heard that the ancients were told, ancients, you shall not commit murder, and whosoever committeth murder shall be liable to the courts. Okay. I'm going to stop right there. Where does it say without, they took out without a cause? Right, let's keep going. They said, liable to the court. You can be brought to court and be judged guilty because you got angry. But I say to you that any, everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. Anybody who's angry with the brother is guilty before the court. They've sinned. And whosoever, let's see, and whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whosoever and whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Now, when I compared Scripture with Scripture with them and went over to Matthew 21, they took out Jesus getting angry in Matthew 21. But, you go over to John chapter 2, verse 13. I was talking about the other passages that talks about the same event in their own Bible, the NASB. The past, uh, John chapter 2, verse 13 in the NASB, The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. And he made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, Take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. There's a cause there. Jesus had cause to be angry. But according to their Bible, they took that out. Not only did Jesus sin, but he's worthy of judgment. He's guilty. Okay? People can say, I'm stretching it, but I'm not. I don't believe I am. Okay? If Jesus is a sinner, then he deserved to die on that cross. It's that simple what they're trying to push. These Bible perversions, these false Christians, these false religions that like to claim a Jesus Christ, but they wouldn't know the Jesus Christ if he was standing right before them, you know, kind of like it was back then, healing people and doing all these miracles and signs, fulfilling scripture. They wouldn't know him. They don't know who Jesus Christ is. They love their Jesus Christ. Um... 
New Living Translation, Matthew 5, 21. You have heard that our ancestors were told you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of fires of hell. Where is without a cause? Getting angry without a cause. They took out without a cause. You're guilty, you're a sinner if you're angry with somebody. All right? Um, even if you have a cause. Now granted, if you don't have a cause and you get angry because you're the one in the wrong, I understand that. But that's why Jesus said in his perfect written word, without a cause. If you have a cause, it's okay to get angry sometimes. Matthew 21, 12. Okay, they just said if you get angry, you're um, subject to judgment. Matthew 21, 12. Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out all the people buying and selling animals for sacrifice. He knocked over the tables of the money lenders, or money changer, changers, and the chairs of those selling doves. He said to them, The scriptures declare, My temple will be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. Once again, their own Bible comparing scripture and scripture. Jesus is a sinner, and he's worthy of judgment. How do you get away from that? How I just when I truly got saved, it was based off of the true gospel. I got brought to the true word of God, Jesus Christ. But what I'm trying to say is, is first thing I did before I really truly got saved was is I got pointed to the Bible version issue. And God got me away from these Bible perversions, got me into the King James Bible, and that's when I learned about the real Jesus Christ. It's where I found the true gospel. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life, and that you, that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. I was only capable of believing in the real Jesus Christ because God pointed me to his perfect written word. You want to know the truth? God will show you the truth. You want to live with lies? God will let you keep your Bible perversions. I got to the point where I wanted to know the truth. Okay? You want to know the truth, God will bring you to him. His name is Jesus Christ, the real Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. So we see there that they try to tear Jesus down and make him out to be a sinner. He's not just likeness of sinful flesh, he is sinful flesh, and not only that, they're also promoting that he deserved to die on the cross. He's worthy of judgment. Now you can't get away from that. It's all about tearing Jesus down. Okay, another big one is, and it's a big one, is the Lord versus Lord without the word the. Right? Romans 10.9. Turn to Romans 10.9. Getting a little hot in here. I have to keep it hot because I've got another set of baby chickens going and this place can get really cold so I've been have to keep it a little bit warmer. So hopefully I don't yawn. <laughs> Romans 10 9 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord the Lord Jesus shalt and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Okay? The Lord Jesus Christ. Because people are always talking about that. Well, we can just say Lord Jesus, you know, or, or Jesus, you know, just Lord Jesus. What's the big deal about thee? Okay? Why is the word thee so important? I'm going to go through some verses, turn to them. Always have your Bible open to make sure I, I'm not lying to you, but I'm trying to keep this from being too long. And with the new camera, I can't tell the time and how long it's been. Um, but I can with that. Uh, 1 Timothy 6.15. Turn to 1 Timothy 6.15. When his, which is his times, he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of Kings and capital L, Lord of lowercase l, Lords. Now some will argue that there's a capital L, Lord there. I understand that. But the whole point I'm reading this verse is there's a distinction between the two. There's this Lord that's separate from the rest of the Lords. Capital L Lord. It's a definitive statement. Lord of Lords. There's only one. That's what the is. It's definitive. When I say the car going up the hill, there could be 50 cars going up that hill. But the moment I say the car, I'm talking about a specific one. 
Now I can give more, ex uh, more um, description on the car so you can pick it out. But when you say the, it's singular. It separates it from everything else. Mm -hmm. That's what we see there. Revelation, chap uh, Revelation 17, verse 14. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords, and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. We see that again. There's a distinction. It separates him from all the other lords. And when we read in uh, Romans 10.9, it's not talking about other lords, but it still does a distinction. That word, the Lord, is distinction that still, it doesn't have to say Lord, capital L, Lord, of lowercase l, lords. It says the capital L, Lord. In other words, it's already distinct, defining him and pulling him apart, saying he is the capital L, Lord of lords. Okay? The, he's the only one. If you just say Lord and you take the out, Lord can be anybody. You say, well, it's got a capital L. We're talking about Bible perversions, brothers and sisters in Christ. They can do anything. You take the word thee out like they did. They took the word thee out, and now it's just Lord. Well, we kept the capital. But how long before they take the capital L off? Okay. Thee is definitive. There's only one. One capital L Lord. One God. One real Jesus Christ. Okay. When you take thee out... It could be any Lord. It could be multi Maybe there's more than one capital L Lord. Okay? Think of it that way. Maybe there's more than one capital L Lord. There might be multiple, because it doesn't say the. And people get onto us saying it's not that big of a deal. Okay? Remember, uh, if you use the before a noun, it separates the noun from all the other nouns. It is set apart. Like I said, the car is going up the hill. You're talking about a specific car. There could be 50, a million cars going up the, the hill. But you're talking about one car when you say the car is going up the hill. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many, lowercase g, but gods many, and lords many. It's a lowercase l lord, but it says lords many. Why is the the so important? Because okay. there's only one god. Only one capital Lord. And that's what we're going to get to the next verse. Verse 6. But to us, there's but one God. Now, why is it comparing capital G God to the lowercase g gods there? If it's the capital G is all it's necessary. Okay? It's comparing because the world doesn't see it that way. There's no distinction for the world. There's but one capital G God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in Him, and one Lord... It's capital L, but it's still comparing them to the Lord's many that we read in the previous verse, verse 5. There's one Lord, Jesus Christ, for whom are all things, and we by him. We see capital L, Lord, and we say, okay, that's Jesus Christ who is God, fully and completely. The Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. But it's still comparing it to Lord's many, saying there's a distinction to the world, there's lots of lords. Okay? There's lots of false gods. Okay? To us, there's only but one capital L Lord, Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. Singular. One. There's only one. There's not many capital L Lords. There's only one Lord Jesus Christ. So when you read that, it's also promoting, brothers and sisters, multiple Jesuses. And people can fight me all they want. You look at the world today, brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm talking about the lost people, the professing Christian world, but brothers and sisters in Christ, you've looked around, you've seen it, how many different versions of Jesus Christ are out there? The, not the Lord, but Lord, I say, I do this like I'm taking out, I'm taking out the word the, it's just Lord Jesus. How many different versions are out there? Because there is no the Lord. There's just whatever Jesus is best for you, whichever Jesus you want. You know, just pick what you want. Find the Jesus that best suits you, that comes down to your level. 
Now, there are other lords mentioned in the Bible. The best example I was throwing there is Sarah calls Abraham Lord in Genesis 18, 12. My Lord. It's his wife calling her husband Lord. But it's a lowercase l because in the Bible that's our distinction. Capital L, there's only one Lord. Okay? The Lord Jesus Christ. But there's other people that are called Lords. And you look down through the history books and our history, when there's a Lord, they put a capital L on it a lot of times. Okay? There's only one capital L Lord, that's Jesus Christ. But there's a definitive statement when you use the word the. There's no arguing it. The Lord Jesus Christ. Well, which Lord? He's the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, but you know, the, you know this Jesus Christ that is Lord Jesus in this book, no, the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about one Lord Jesus Christ, a specific Lord Jesus Christ. There's no getting around it when you use the word the, and people will still fight this. Now, if Jesus is not the Lord, you know, the Lord God Almighty, which we see in many passages too, the Lord, singular, God Almighty, one God. Once again, if Jesus isn't God, you're tearing him down. Okay? If he's not the one God, he's just like any other man. He's, he's, he's a Lord, just like you can be a Lord. You can be a God, knowing good and evil, and Jesus is just a Lord, just like us. First okay. Timothy two five. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord God Almighty. We've seen, we can see that in passage. I didn't write down where that's at, but you can look it up. First Timothy two five. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. There's a mediator and there's one God. Once again, I just grabbed this because there's a lot of the verses that says there's one God. We even read one. What? There's one God, the Father. There's only one God, okay? There's just one Lord, and that Lord, Jesus Christ, is God. But to take away the definitive the there, you're tearing Jesus down. And even if it seems subtle, even if people say, well, it's not that big of a deal, it's still tearing Jesus down, trying to get him to come down so we can raise ourselves up. And the last one we're going to talk about, a big one, and this is also a big one, is... And people, people are like, oh, you're getting into this again. Is come. Okay. We'll talk about why it's so important that these Bible perversions change is come to has come. And that totally destroys who Jesus is. Okay. First John 4, 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the spirit of God. Stop there. It says false prophets have gone out in the world. What did we just talk about a few, se a few seconds to a minute ago? There's so many Jesuses out there. How do you know which is which? The Lord Jesus Christ has given us his perfect word. The Jesus Christ who is come in the flesh. There's one Jesus. All right. There's many antichrists, but there's only one real, true Jesus Christ. But there's going to be people out there that are going to be promoting false Christs. False Jesuses. Another Jesus. As we read in Corinthians, you know, they promote another Jesus, another gospel. They, they bestow another spirit, Antichrist spirit, which we're going to read about right here. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Bible perversions like to change that to has come. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. The Antichrist spirit. These false Jesuses, these Bible perversions that we've been reading, where they're tearing Jesus down. And these are just a few. I'm just throwing a few out there, because I didn't want to do a 50-hour study uh, on Bible perversions. They've already been done. I've got some on my, on my channel. But they're all about t tearing Jesus down and presenting you with an Antichrist. Not the real Jesus Christ, an Antichrist. Okay? Now, when we read this, comparing it to the study that we're doing, the likeness of sinful flesh, you know what it says, is come in the flesh. It doesn't say likeness of sinful flesh. Okay? It just says flesh. You know? So there's two things when we, you study the Bible that you learn is there's likeness of sinful flesh, 
okay? And then you have your incorruptible body. Okay, it's still flesh. We're going to be talking about that here. It's still flesh, but it's incorruptible. You have flesh that's corruptible, sinful flesh, and you have flesh that's incorruptible. Okay? There are two different types of flesh. It doesn't say specific. It says is come. So in the Old Testament, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh in his incorruptible body. And we're going to talk about that. When he came for 33 years, he came in the flesh, is come in the flesh. But it was likeness of sinful flesh. He died, was buried, rose again the third day, and he's in his incorruptible flesh, is come in the flesh. Right? Um, there's people who fight this, and it's like, uh, it frustrates you at first, and then it's like, just you just got to pray for them and say, Lord, open their eyes. If they want the truth, if you're truly seeking the truth, God will show it to you. Luke 2, 7. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in his swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him, for them in the inn. I wrote this one out because, um, brothers and sisters in Christ, nobody's going to argue that Jesus had a body of flesh when he was born of a Virgin Mary. He grew up. He got tired. He got hungry. He could feel pain. He died on a cross. Okay? Nobody's going to argue that fact. Well, I always say no one, but you always come across somebody who likes to argue. Okay? So Jesus was born when he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He had a body of flesh. Nobody should argue that. Now, uh, Jesus died, was buried, and he, and he rose again, and he came to the, Jew, uh, to the disciples. And look what's going on here in Luke chapter 24, verse 38. This is after he died, the likeness of sinful flesh, gone. He's got his new glorified body. You say, well, it's not flesh. Let's, keep, let's read this. Luke 24, 38. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? 39. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, handle me, and see. For our spirit hath not flesh and bones. Jesus is saying, I have flesh and bones. I have a body of flesh. I'm not a ghost. I'm not a spirit. As you see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and of a honeycomb, and he took it and did eat them, eat before them. Okay. Jesus had a body of flesh. His glorified body, his resurrected body, is a body of flesh. He even says so himself. Mm -hmm. Is come in the flesh. It can be used any time. Old Testament. Okay, right here, Genesis 5, 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the trees to desire to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband and with her, and he did eat. That's what's going on today, even today. Okay. People think they're wiser than God with these Bible perversions. They can't hand, they don't want God's word. They want their own words. They want their own wisdom. Verse 7, And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Two things there. If it's not a physical body, then how can they hide from God? They know this. They have this knowledge now. They hadn't the knowledge before. It's a physical body that they're hiding from. Okay, it's not the Holy Spirit's everywhere. Well, I'm going to hide from the Holy Spirit. You can't hide from the Holy Spirit. Well, I'm going to hide from God the Father. You can't do that. Jesus' physical body, he knew where they were before anybody gets on to me. I know Jesus knew they couldn't hide from God, and Jesus is like, I don't know where they are. But the point is, is it's a physical body walking in the garden that they're hiding from. Okay? Jesus is come in the flesh. Jesus is the body, God the Father is the soul, and the Holy Spirit is the spirit. Okay, look at uh, a lot of my studies on the uh, Trinity versus the Godhead, the true Godhead. Body, soul, and spirit were made in his likeness. But the point of this is, he had a body in the Old Testament. The beginning of creation, he was there. Let us make man in our image. Right? 
Holy uh, Spirit, body, and soul. Now, he had a body of flesh there. Which about further on down? Genesis 18, 1. So right there, you can say in, Je in Garden of Eden, Jesus is come in the flesh. He had a body of flesh. That was Jesus Christ. Jesus, because it says the Lord God. Remember, there's only one capital L, Lord. Jesus Christ. One capital G, God, the Father. They're one and the same. That's talking about Jesus when it comes to the physical. He's walking. Genesis 18, 1. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day, and he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him, and when he had saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself towards the ground. Okay, the three men. You have Jesus Christ. It's the Lord appeared unto him. You have Jesus Christ and two angels. There's three men total. And said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet. That's flesh. Okay, he stood body of flesh stands he stood now they're going to wash his feet that's flesh and rest yourselves under the tree and I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts after that ye shall pass on for therefore ye come to your servant and they said so do as thou hast said and Abraham hastened into his tent unto Sarah and said make ready quickly three measures of fine meal knead it and make cakes upon the hearth and Abraham ran into the herd and fetched a calf tender and good and gave it unto a young man, and he hastened to dress it. And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. Would we just read about Jesus and his resurrected body, his glorified, incorruptible body of flesh and bones? How did he prove it? He, had, he ate something in front of him. This is Jesus Christ and two angels eating in the Old Testament. Jesus is come in the flesh. At this time, if you were there, you could say Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. You couldn't say has, past tense, is come. Okay. Not has come, is come. Revelation 1.13 okay. Revelation 1.13 And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one looked one like unto the Son of Man, clothed in a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hair was white like wool, and as white as snow. This is talking about a flesh, his body, a flesh. Okay. And his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, and as, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice is a sound of many waters. Jump down to Revelation 19.11. Not jump down, but turn to Revelation 19, 11. So this we have Jesus Christ describing his body of flesh. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. But what better way to say it, Revelation 19, 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and of righteousness he, just, he doth judge and make war. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, you know. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. I'm not saying they'll do this, but I mean, for that statement of why it's so important for is come, is this, Jesus is coming down on the white horse. We're coming down with him. The battle of Armageddon. Everybody's running around. What do we do? It's Jesus. He is come in the flesh. Now think about it. Oh, he has come. Well, then what are we worried about? If he has come, what are we worried about? He is come in the flesh. All right? That's why it's so important. Something God got me thinking about is John, the, uh, who wrote this. Okay. He's in the Isle of Patmos, and he's writing. And G, uh, John is the disciple whom Jesus loved. He was there and saw Jesus get resurrected in the sense that he was there, a flesh, we read about it, a flesh, uh, a ghost or spirit hath not flesh and bones. Here's my hands. Let me eat something to show you. I, I have a body of flesh. It's me. I, I'm, I'm alive. Okay. 
This is, this is John writing this in the Isle of Patmos. And when he's writing it down, this is after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus has come in the flesh. What would John be saying if, he's, if that was the truth? He'd be denying the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's not is come. He has come. John's one writing this. He has come in the flesh. You know, he died. I mean, I was there. I saw the resurrection. Jesus was there. He shows his ha the holes in his hands and feet. And he, he ate food before us. I mean, I saw that. But you know what? No, uh, I'm sorry. It ha has come. Has come. He died on the cross and he's gone. He's gone. He's no more. Has come. No more. Is that what John is saying? That's why the King James Bible is so important, brothers and sisters of Christ. That's why this is our most prized physical, most, I want to say it right, most physical prized possession you have on this earth is the Word of God. Okay? And that's why you need to make sure you have it. And I know I have it, the King James Bible. And you need to make sure to study it, live it, believe it, hold on to it, and don't let go of it. Is come in the flesh. John said, is come. Jesus had already died. He's resurrected. He shows himself to him, and now John's writing this down saying, Jesus is come in the flesh. These Bible versions say has come. Okay? And they say flesh. I know I just did a really quick one, but you can do a huge study on this showing how Jesus had more passages where Jesus is come in the flesh. Jesus had flesh in the Old Testament before the world began. Jesus is the one that created everything. By him all things consist. It was there before the beginning of time. Jesus had a body of flesh all throughout the Old Testament up to the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, because that's still Old Testament. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh, but he still had a body of flesh. He has a body of flesh throughout all eternity, the resurrection. Okay. Saying has come in the flesh is tearing him down, saying, well, the Jesus that, that came in the likeness of sinful flesh, well, he really wasn't God, you see, because... When Jesus said it is finished on the cross, he just meant he was dead. That's what these Bible perversions are saying. And they'll turn around and they'll argue and they'll fight about it and they'll fight about it. They're tearing Jesus down. Jesus is not, is come the flesh. God, from the very beginning to the very end, Alpha and Omega, that's not the God of, that's not the Jesus Christ of these Bible perversions. Okay? The Jesus Christ of the King James Bible, he is Alpha and Omega. He is the capital L Lord Jesus Christ. The definitive is come in the flesh, present tense. Every time you say it, it's present tense. I say it a week from now. I'm saying that Jesus is come in the flesh a week from now. I said it a month ago. He is come in the flesh. Yeah. So now, if I say it now, according to these Bible versions, I should say has come in the flesh. Because I already said is come in the flesh a month ago. Now I should say has because it's only referring to a month ago. No, is come in the flesh is always present tense. I can say that every day of my life, that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Okay? Don't be deceived. Okay? Get away from these Bible perversions. Okay? They've uh, perverted. Satan's already perverted mankind. He deceived Eve, and Adam chose to sin with Eve. Okay? He's got he's corrupted mankind. Okay. He's tried corrupting Jesus Christ and failed miserably. He tried to get men, the men he corrupted, to corrupt Jesus Christ. And they failed. Okay. Now what's what's Satan been doing since the very beginning also? He's been trying to corrupt God's word. Yea hath God said. Stick with the King James Bible, brothers and sisters of Christ. This is God's Word. Stick to the real Jesus Christ of Scripture. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He became sin who knew no sin on the cross. He was sinless. He was never corrupted. He was in a body that was corruptible, but he never was corrupted. Why? Because he's God. And all these Bible versions that we read, they're trying to tear him down and make him not to be God. Okay? And then you get, I didn't get into the Trinity, but then you get into the Trinity that tears him down and makes him a lowercase g God. Makes him equal to Satan. 
Okay, because there's only one capital G God, the Father. There's only one capital G God, period. There's no three gods that make up one God. Okay, you have three lowercase, because you have to make them lowercase g gods. If you say there's three capital G gods that make up one capital G God, you make God's word a lie. There's not one capital G God. There's four. You know, three that make up one. That's four. And people just can't get that. So I might be going off a little bit there because that always irritates me when it comes to the Godhead versus the Trinity. You love God's word. You believe it. and You have a love of the truth. You're going to ditch the Trinity for the Godhead in a heartbeat. I did. I didn't even believe in the Trinity. I just used Trinity terms, but I even dropped that in a heartbeat when I was shown the truth. Okay? Likeness of sinful flesh. There's a difference between being likeness of sinful flesh and actually being sinful. Okay? He proved he's God because he came into a body that was capable of, that was capable of being tempted. He was tempted by Satan, by men. Uh, Satan perverting God's word. Okay? Are we being tempted today with the same things? We're being tempted by our flesh. We're being tempted by Satan and his demons. We're being tempted by the lost world, by men. And we're being tempted by, we have a perfect written word of God, but before I was saved, I was being tempted for the longest time by these Bible perversions that weren't God's word. They were perverting God's word. So Satan will pervert God's word to tempt people. Well, this Bible's okay with my sin, so I'm going to choose this Bible instead of the King James Bible. This book condemns my sin. This book tells me I'm a bondservant to Jesus Christ. This book tells me what I have to do. It's not a suggestion. It's not a guideline. It's a command. I have to do it. I don't like this book. I'm going to go pick a Bible that's okay with my sin. Okay. So hopefully this whole series of studies have helped out when it comes to the birth of Jesus Christ. One of the biggest things to remember is that birth is he was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. Okay, the word was made flesh. It's talking about the likeness of sinful flesh. Give me a second. Actually, I did have that down real quick. Just real quick. John 1.14 And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Was made flesh, past tense. It's talking about that 33 year period that Jesus Christ was born of a Virgin Mary and he came, he was made in flesh. But you know how God always reveals things more and more to us over time. We find out in the New Testament that that made, uh, and the word was made flesh is talking about the likeness of sinful flesh. Okay. That 33 year period that Jesus was on the earth. Okay. So hopefully this has helped uh, to realize that the birth of Jesus Christ, uh, one of the most important things is to understand is likeness of sinful flesh. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh so he could die on the cross and become sin who knew no sin. An incorruptible body can't take on the sins of the world. He had to give that up and become in the likeness of sinful flesh so he'd be prepared to do that. Okay? So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching.